I was awakened by the morning light and the singing of the mountain bluebirds. I heard the stomping of chipmunks running around the campsite, trying to clean up any crumbs left over from the previous night's freeze-dried food. The sense of exhilaration I felt backpacking after so many years quickly faded away when the reality of what the day would bring was put in front of me. Here, at 6,000 feet, the air was crisp and cool, and as I stepped out of my tent, I was engulfed by the beauty of the alpine lake surrounded by the snowy mountaintops at my campsite. I wanted to stay here longer. I wanted to cast a rod with a trolling rod or fly, but I knew that today was the day I had dreaded for the past month, a confrontation that I must get past quickly and definitively in order to start over. I cooked some sort of breakfast of eggs and sausage and thick black coffee on the propane stove. As I sat and finished my fuel for the six-mile hike, I marveled at how beautiful and peaceful this moment in time was. I reminded myself that, yes, there can be beauty and enjoyment of life on the other side if you just keep moving forward with the right mindset. I knew I would definitely return to camping, hiking, fishing, and sailing, just a few of the hobbies I had left behind during my 23-year marriage to the love of my life. More specifically, to the man I once considered with all my heart to be the love of my life. Now I hoped there would be another one someday. The hike down was nice and short, and I didn't meet anyone on the trail or in the parking lot as I packed up my car and drove out onto the main highway. I turned my phone back on as I had been offline for the past three days and knew that as soon as I was in cell tower range, the texts, voicemails, and emails would start. As I pulled onto the two-lane paved county road, the first message beeped, and when I looked down, I saw it was a text from my 21-year-old son, Ryan. Ryan and I were not only father and son, but best friends who had been through the trials and tribulations of his tumultuous teenage years, and had come out of them with great respect and love for each other. Ryan's message was short and to the point. Dad, I love you and support you. Good luck today and stay positive. Somewhere, someday, there will be a light at the end of this tunnel. His promise of support brought tears to my eyes and helped justify what I had to do. The next message I opened was from my daughter Krista, and it too contained a promise of support and love. Daddy, I wish I could be with you and hold you and tell you everything is going to be okay. You've been the best father we could have ever imagined, and you always put us first. Now you need to put yourself first, no matter what it is, and know that Ryan and I love you and will always be there for you. Krista was always daddy's little girl, and although she was an exact replica of my beautiful wife Linda in her younger years, Krista possessed my desire for adventure, love of the outdoors, and a crazy sense of humor that Linda did not. At least for my 23 years, I was blessed with children I loved, respected, and who would be the best legacy I would ever leave behind at the end of what I hoped would be a happy and fulfilling life. I stopped in the parking lot to carefully review my messages, emails, voicemails, and missed calls. There had been 10 missed calls from my wife in the last three days, the first seven or so most likely due to her three-day banking seminar and supposed business trip to Vegas, and the last three since her return last night and then this morning. I imagined how angry she'd been when I hadn't been at the airport to pick her up and when I hadn't returned any of her calls or texts. I didn't bother dealing with the voicemails, deleted them all, and moved on to the rest of my inbox. As it turned out, Linda had texted me about 20 messages in the last three days, and again I hadn't responded to any of them. I took a quick look through them. The first few were her declarations of undying love for me. What nonsense, I thought, probably done out of guilt. And the last few were venomous. They dripped resentment at me for not answering her, not returning her calls and making her wait at the airport for over an hour before she finally realized I wasn't coming. The last text from her was simply WTF Jack, written in big letters. How our relationship had changed over the past month. Although from her perspective, I don't think she even realized that the spark of love in me that had been forever burning for her was slowly going out. I really couldn't understand it. Had she really become so distant from me over the past treacherous four months? Had she completely stopped thinking about me, about my feelings and the pain in my eyes, which I was amazed she couldn't see? Had she so easily forgotten her children, our family, and the loving life we had shared for so long? It was perhaps even more depressing than her affair. 
In her 44 years, Linda was still beautiful. She had incredible curves, slender legs, firm breasts, and she knew how to use her body for any occasion, whether flirting at a social event or playing the role of a rising banking star in the trust department of U.S. Commerce Bank. I was always proud to be seen with her and enjoyed the way men would stare at her as we walked by, barely containing their lust and keeping their eyes on her. The realization that she was mine and we were bonded to her forever gave me a huge surge of self-esteem and ego as we walked past the lustful stares of strangers. I told her how beautiful and desirable she was, but she always replied that she was getting older and no longer felt as young, vibrant, and sexy as she used to. I could see that this bothered her and tried to assure her that her light was getting brighter, not dimmer, but she just ignored my compliments, saying, you just have to say that because you are my husband and you love me. Perhaps the reason for all her lies and deceit was buried in those feelings of fleeting and lost youth. But I was sure I would never know. Perhaps she wouldn't know either. Anyway, her younger boss, John Monroe, had somehow become a new light in her life, at least sexually, if not in terms of the boring but reliable best friend to which I was now obviously classified. Although to me we had even gone beyond friendship, Linda didn't notice it. John Monroe, as vice president of the trust department, was rich, thin, tall, and so self-assured that the few times I met him, he seemed obnoxious. But Linda thought he was the epitome of a great leader. At least that's what she used to say when we discussed her work life and his. But four months ago, that stopped abruptly. In retrospect, I now speculate that this was the beginning of her affair. The beginning of the end of 23 years together. I pushed the depressing thoughts aside looked at my phone again and deleted all her messages with an angry snarl, then went to my email. The email from my attorney informed me that everything was ready to go as he and I had discussed. I also noticed that I had a Snapchat, and upon opening it, it read, The man you were interested in was in a serious accident when he was mugged, one testicle shattered and his knee shattered. When I closed the chat, it was immediately erased. The next email I looked at was confirmation that my resignation from my job had been accepted and my 401k and stock options liquidated and funds transferred to my new checking account. I was free, at least for a few years, although the tax hit would be painful. But I didn't care at all. I needed to leave. I was about to pull into the driveway when the phone rang and I saw that it was Linda. I decided that now was not the time as it was now and equated it to ripping off a Band-Aid. It had to be done quickly and with conviction. I pulled to the corner of the stop, turned off the car, and answered the phone as unemotionally as I could. Hi, Linda, how are you? What's up? What the hell do you mean? First of all, where are you? You weren't at the airport to pick me up, and you weren't home all night. You didn't even leave a note or return any of my calls or texts since last week. What the hell, Jack? Tell me what's the matter. Linda, I didn't think you'd care if I answered or not or whether you see me or not. I thought you'd be glad I wasn't home. That way you could clean yourself up and get back into character before you saw me, the kids, our friends, or your parents. Isn't that how you arrange your double life? I mean, what? Why do you say that, Jack? I don't even understand. What double life? You know I have to travel for work. And by the way, why aren't the kids answering my calls or texts? And where's our queen mattress from the master bedroom? I had to sleep in the guest bedroom last night. Jack, what the hell is going on? Where the hell are you? And why did you leave me at the airport? I feel like I'm in the twilight zone and nothing makes sense. Linda, you are in such a twilight zone that you have driven yourself and our entire family into... Linda's anger and aggressive verbal onslaught tapered off as her confidence apparently began to plummet and her worst fears began to surface. What? What the hell does that mean, Jack? Where are you and what's going on? It doesn't matter where I am or where I'm going, but I'm out of town, Linda, and I've been too busy for the last week to answer your texts and calls. I've been very busy trying to figure out how to survive a major betrayal in my current life and start a new life. Linda hesitated and her voice shook at the word betrayal, but she continued to play dumb and yelled, What, Jack? Are you drunk? What are you talking about? First of all, Linda, Tell me how your three-day banking conference went. Did that asshole John get a chance to fuck you every night and morning or just three nights? I heard her sigh and pause when I said that. 
and it took her a few seconds to respond. What the hell are you talking about? John, who are you saying this to and why? I'm married to you. Yes, Linda, you are married to me, and I'm amazed that you still consider it a marriage. So maybe after 23 years of marriage, you'll at least have the courtesy to tell me the damn truth. I know you've had no respect or care for me or your family over the past few months, but now that the lies and deceit are out in the open, how about you be honest about it? Linda replied in a trembling and soft voice. Jack, I don't know what you've imagined, but you're wrong. I love only you. There is nothing between me and John Monroe. Well, at least you've now admitted that you know which John we're talking about. For a moment, I thought we had more than one John. Linda, tell me honestly, did you think you'd never get caught? Or didn't you care? Did you bother to tell me you wanted a divorce and loved someone else? It would have been so much easier for everyone if you'd just had the courage to tell us before you lied and cheated behind our backs. Jack, Linda shouted, and I could hear the tears welling up in her voice. Don't even mention the word divorce. Please believe me, I only love you. Please come home so we can talk about this. Nothing's going on, how can you think otherwise? Linda was obviously convinced that I had no proof and was bluffing, so she was going to continue this farce. So you never slept with Monroe in our bedroom on our missing queen-sized mattress? No, of course not. What the hell are you talking about? Linda, wait a minute, okay? With those words, I held up the picture of John Monroe sleeping with Linda. She looked like she was in ecstasy, and judging by the strained expression on his face, he was obviously giving it his best shot. It was one of many photos and videos taken with a button camera hidden in plain sight in the dresser clock I bought a month ago when I found out about her affair. I sent the photo to Linda and returned to the conversation. Linda, pull up the picture I just sent you. Are you telling me that's not my loving wife being doggy style fucked in my bedroom on a king-sized mattress without a condom by her fucking boss? I heard her drop the phone and scream in agony. Oh God, no, Jack, please, it was a mistake. It only happened once. It didn't mean anything. It was just a fling, just the thrill of seeing someone younger who wanted me so badly make me feel sexy and young again. It was an isolated incident, and I really didn't mean to hurt you. Oh, God, I'm so sorry, but Jack, if... I interrupted her by yelling into the phone. Linda, look out the back window in the middle of the backyard. See that pile of charred wood, metal, and ashes? That's our fucking queen-sized mattress. It's a symbol of how you burned down our marriage, how you betrayed our family, how you humiliated me. When did you start hating me enough to hurt me like this? When did you decide that you no longer cared about my love or the love of our family? When did you decide I was no longer worthy of your respect or honesty? When and why did you decide to throw us away like the morning trash? Jack, please, please forgive me. I love you. I don't hate you. I could never hate you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. It was an accident, a bad mistake. And it was just a one-time thing. I was the one who was selfish. There was never anything about you. Please, Jack, come home and talk to me. Linda, the kids and I are tired of the lies and deceit. Can you finally be honest with me? Is that why the kids won't return my calls? Jack, are you the one who told them and turned them against me? How dare you, Linda? I didn't do a damn thing to turn the kids away from you. You did it yourself. Well, I mean you and your lover buddy. That's all you. Your selfish, self-centered attitude and need for another man's man is what drove you into the twilight zone and what destroyed our entire family, drove us all away from you. And no, I didn't tell the kids. The kids told me. That's pathetic. I never thought you could lie so easily, deceive me and abandon us. At least stop lying now. It wasn't just one fucking time. It's been going on for at least four months now, judging by the way you've emotionally cut us all out of your life. And the sad thing is, you didn't even realize it. You've stopped talking to us, stopped looking at me, stopped making love to me except for the rare occasions of merciful sex. You disgust me. Jack, it didn't mean anything. It was just sex, just once, and just a brief lapse in a 23-year marriage. I want you, not John. Please believe me. Linda, wait. I pulled the next picture out of my phone, the one where Ryan came home unannounced to pick up his tools and heard his mother and Monroe fighting. 
He crept quietly to the open door of the master bedroom, held his phone out to the door jam, and took a few pictures and some video. He was so upset. He didn't tell me about it for two weeks until Krista and he decided I had a right to know, and they called me together and told me, and we all cried and were in physical pain watching the betrayal of their mother, my wife, to her boss. That's what prompted me to buy a spy camera. I sent this picture to Linda as well. Linda, open your phone again. This is the first time either of us has ever found out about you and your fucking boss. Although judging by the way you severed all emotional ties with me three months before this picture, I'm sure you've been lovers for a long time. Linda, the first Ryan knew about you, and he took the picture. How the hell do you think your son feels about you after seeing such a betrayal from his mother? Do you think it might have alienated him and you might have lost his respect as well as Krista's as they looked at those pictures and tried to decide whether or not to tell me about your cheating and promiscuous behavior? Do you really think you have an ounce of trust or respect from them now? Do you know how painful it was for them to tell me about you being a cheating whore and how hard it was to hear them cry as they watched you destroy our marriage and destroy our family? Just stop lying that it only happened once, and that it didn't go on for months, and that you didn't sleep with him six or seven times on your last business trip. I'm hanging up on the next lie you tell. No, Jack, please let me explain. I could hear Linda's lungs bursting out and imagined her collapsing to the floor, finally realizing that her lies and betrayal had hurt her family and herself. Oh God, Jack, I'm so sorry, so sorry. Please, you have to forgive me. I lost my mind, but it's all behind me now. It was just cheap and slutty sex, and it was so exciting to be desired and to indulge in illicit affairs in secret. I felt young and desirable again, but the love wasn't there, and I never meant to hurt you, but I don't know how I couldn't see that it was. I didn't even realize how distant I had become from you and the children. And I'm ashamed to admit that just now, when I wake up, I see myself as some other person from a horror movie or nightmare, and I hate myself for it because I love you, them, and our life together. Oh, dear Jack, please, please, please come home so I can make things right. I need us to be a family again. Linda, we're gone. It's over between us. You can't believe you really loved me after the pain and heartache you caused me. You have shown that you have no respect for me. You don't care about anyone but yourself. And because of your lies and deceit, I will never be able to trust you again. Everything we had before is now tainted and suspect. You've been sleeping with him for the last few years or the last four months? How many other men has Linda had? Do I need to have my children's DNA tested? Don't bother answering because I won't believe whatever you say. I definitely need to get tested for STDs. You and I have nothing left. You hurt me in ways that no one has ever hurt me or will ever hurt me, and I could never imagine that the man I loved and bet my life on would throw me away like a piece of trash. But you did. Maybe the kids will eventually come back to you, but I sure as hell never will. Jack, please don't say that. I'll do anything. I'll go to a counselor. You can sleep with other women. Please don't leave me. I was living with guilt, and I wanted to stop, and I would. I would always come back to you. It was just a meaningless affair. Oh, God, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. Linda, take your time. I don't believe a word you say. And at this point, I just don't care about you and your lies anymore. Now listen to me carefully, because here's what's going on. You'll be served with divorce papers at the bank on Monday. God, no, Jack, please don't divorce me. Please. Linda, listen to me. Your boss's wife has already gotten copies of the videotapes and pictures I took of your sordid affair when you slept with him several times in our bedroom, so it's likely that you and John Monroe will either end your relationship or possibly stay with each other when his wife and I dump your cheating asses. Jack, please tell me you didn't do it. He has a wife and two kids. Why are you going to ruin them? Wow, Linda, you just don't get it. I'm not ruining them. It's you and fucking John Monroe that ruined them. Your cheap affair not only ruined my life, your life, and our children's lives, but it will ruin his wife and his children. Are you proud of yourself? You had a hand in ruining the lives of eight people. Lucky for you, you're such a selfish bitch that you probably don't care. She broke into sobs after that harsh remark, and I could hear her gasping into the tube. But I wasn't done yet. 
Your boss will be sued civilly for alienation of affection, although the bailiff may have to find out what hospital he's in. Obviously, he's out of luck. Wrong place, wrong time. I heard from a friend that Monroe got mugged in an airport parking lot and ended up in the hospital with a crushed testicle and a shattered knee, so it's hard to say when he'll be in shape to give you himself again. Stop it, Jack. Stop being so cruel. I don't care about him. I just want you. Please don't do this to us. Look, Linda, again, there is no us. It's hard to tell if your boss and you will have a job by the end of next week because I also sent those pictures to the president and board members of U.S. Commerce Bank, along with a lawsuit for alienation of affection and sexual harassment. If they're willing to settle, I'll try to make sure you keep your job. But I'll demand that they fire him under the article. No, Jack, no. Do you hate me that much? Linda, you're the one who showed your hatred for me with your betrayal, lies, and disrespect. You took my love for you that I held dear and ripped it from my soul. I'm just trying to get my self-respect back before our lives drift apart and we go our separate ways. At this point, Linda was crying so hard and shouting words of disbelief and denial that I was no longer sure she could listen to me. I was losing my contained anger and feeling hurt and remorse for putting her through this because I knew I still loved her even though I knew I also hated her. It was a very disturbing set of emotions tearing at my soul. But overall, I was determined to get revenge and mortally wound her for what she had done to me. Linda, we're almost done here. Try to focus on the next few items. I took the $125,000 we had in savings and used $25,000 to prepay for Krista's next two years of college tuition. I'll help her in the future, but for now, this is what I can afford. I'm leaving you the house. I signed the deed in your name, and the equity is about $100,000 if you sell it now. I'm not selling our house, Jack, and I want you to stop this madness and come home to me so we can heal. Please, for the sake of our 23 years of love and happiness before I go crazy. I ignored the remark and continued. Linda, if you sign the divorce, you keep the house and all of its contents. I keep the $100,000 that's left of our savings, and we're done. If you don't want to sign the divorce or resist, I don't care. I won't be around for you to argue. Do what you want. It doesn't matter to me. We're almost done, Linda. There are still a few more things I need to tell you. If you look around the house, you'll notice that I've moved. I've taken everything I wanted, and what's left you can do with as you see fit. I took our family vacation photos, the wedding photo albums I left you. Keep them, burn them, I don't care. I left my wedding ring on our dresser. You can melt it down or flush it down the toilet like you did with our marriage. Ryan is coming over to get my fishing and hunting supplies he needs, and he prefers to come over when you're not home. So don't freak out if you notice someone has been in the house. He doesn't want to see you. Krista is coming to move out all of her things that she needs. She doesn't plan on living here anymore. She'd also like to stop by when you're away, so don't be surprised if you see her room empty. One last thing you should know is that I've also sent pictures of you and your fucking lover to your parents, my parents, and everyone we know in both of our email databases. So you should work on what story you want to tell them. I'll be damned if I'm going to be the bad guy in this failed marriage. Her crying and screaming had gotten to the point where I was afraid she was going to pass out or have a stroke. This had to end. Linda, Linda, here's another thing. I quit my job last week and am leaving the state for the unknown. I hope that in the future, I can find someone who will love me enough to stay true to the promises we make to each other. Someone who will respect me, treat me as an equal, and someone I can trust and love again. I hope you can find in me what you've obviously been missing. Please don't look for me. If you really need me for something, you can send a message through Ryan or through my lawyer, but I'm out of your life and you're out of mine and nothing more needs to be said. Goodbye, Linda. I heard her scream, Jack, no, no, please, Jack, please forgive me. As I hung up the phone and burst into tears of pain and sobs, I think I realized that I had gone too far in my revenge and it would take me a long time to forgive myself for the cruelty I had shown. I doubted I would ever forgive her. I knew I had a painful road ahead of me before I could heal myself and feel that I was ready for something more than a life of solitude. More than anything, I didn't want to live a life of bitterness. But as I thought back to the morning on top of the mountain, 
I reminded myself that there would still be moments of beauty and magic in my life if I was open to them and kept moving toward a new beginning.